stated that he had over 100 of these leech homages and things of this nature given and taken, which becomes a problem. So if you swore allegiance to Dr. Craig and then you swore allegiance to me, who has your allegiance if you both call on you? So this became problematic. I wanted to find something that could, could kind of give you the idea of vassalage. If you remember the book I showed you on feudal society, there's a brilliant picture in there where you actually see the Lord and the vassal clasping hands together. That shows you the personal connection. Of course, you don't really see it here too much, but this is as close as I could find. For an excellent overview of Western warfare, I would suggest John France. It's a very, very short book, but it is packed with information. It's, it's a very brilliant synthesis. And he's also written, written very widely on the Crusades. And this also treats part of the Crusades as well. This is an anthology of various military historians tackling different subjects. This is also an excellent book, but much more detailed. The situation in Western Europe, cash was scarce. Thus, the closest thing to power in the medieval period was land. Every powerful magnate owned large expanses of land with at least one stronghold, a castle. Government was limited and fragmented. This is why relationships, especially the other personal nature, were so important. I know a lot of people probably think that the knights kind of ruled the day. The fact is that it didn't. Uh, the, the medieval period emphasized defense over offense. And this is especially true with a castle. What's a knight going to do against a castle? Not going to do too much. And the geography and climate in the West also dictated a different type of war. I mean, honestly, can you see a cavalry charge taking place here? I mean, it looks like a golf course. I mean, you can't do too much. And this is how Western Europe looks like. So I mean, the, the, what you could really do with a cavalry charge was very, very limited. It was intimidating, yes, but if you had a castle, you had enough provisions, you had clean water, you had nothing to worry about. The feudal knights were mostly drawn from a warrior aristocracy that fought primarily on horse. They're famous for shock combat. That's a term that we use in military history. The shock comes from this massive horse, this armored knight, coming through the lines and just charging through. The problem is, is that they were good for one go. You didn't get multiple shock attacks. And after they did their initial shot, they became very fragmented, so to speak. They weren't able to regroup. Uh, they were very, very headstrong. A lot of them lacked discipline. And this is probably their, their greatest weakness, was because of these things. They didn't know how to fight as a unit. And the knight was his greatest enemy, just himself. He was headstrong, he lacked restraint, and he relied heavily on brute force rather than strategy. The crossbow. The crossbow was extremely effective. It required very little training. You can literally pick it up and use it and be pretty accurate with it. It was devastating what you could do with it. And it could pierce armor. This wasn't always the case with the recurve bow, depending on the distance of things of this nature. And this is a this is a picture of it. And Princess Anna Comnena, she was a princess in Byzantium, and she called it a truly diabolical machine. And if you see it in action, it can actually pierce stone. That you could actually go into stone and actually move your way up. You can hold your body weight. That's how powerful it was. This is the Bayou Tapestry. This this thing is impressive. It's named after the city it was founded. And you can actually still see this today. I think it's over 200 feet long. And this is where we get, a, we call it a pictorial document. This is how we know a lot of how people fought in, medieval, in the medieval period, especially in Western Europe. So when a lot of it, especially with lances, everybody thinks that you know at night you would go and he would joust people around. Well, that's not the case. You would use it as a striking implement. So you'd use it almost like it was a, like a knife. And it wasn't, you know, eight foot long, it wasn't 10 foot long. Oftentimes they were four or five foot long. The 
is 230 feet long. In most of your military history, such as John Grant's that we looked at just a little moment ago, he, he relies very heavily on the Bayou Tapestry to substantiate many of his arguments. Fortifications. The sieges were numerous and abnormally lengthy engagements. What made fortresses and castles singular during this period was their location. You wanted to have the best location possible. You can have the best castle, but if it's in a valley, you know, and everybody can laugh stuff at you, you know, you didn't pick a good place. You want to pick a good location for the area. And if you see, a lot of times they'll show pictorial photographs, especially like in the south of England, and you'll see just flat plains, and then you'll see this high outcropping, and you'll see a castle on top of it. You want to have the most commanding position. The strength of a medieval fortress lay in the extraordinary solidity of its construction. What's interesting is that we tend to think that most castles look like this. And this wasn't really, this is very expensive to do. You just couldn't, you know, pop this over and you know, I'm going to have a castle. It's not going to work that way. This took a lot of money and a lot of time to build. Most of your castles up until maybe the 11th to 12th century were made out of wood. Much more easier to construct. You know, it wouldn't cost an arm and a leg. But it was prone to fire. There are very few effective offensive strategies to use against a castle. The medieval period favored defense over attack. What could an army of knights, I use, I put italics around army because, as John France goes, most people like to stay away from that because they weren't really armed. So they were just, you know, considered them, you know, just a group of thugs, really. Uh, most of them, historians don't have a high opinion of the feudal knight. You couldn't do much against the Rostock castle. But they did have a couple of options. Uh, one was mining, but you had to have uh, really good engineers for this. It was useful, but the castle was heavily defended, surrounded by a deep moat, and had plenty of food and flowing water. This method was worse than useless. Starving out the inhabitants was another method, but often than not, most armies would disband after a protracted siege, ravishing the countryside in their way. They used a scorched earth policy. They would go through, you know, cause as much havoc as possible. Then they would, you know, try to do something with them, see if they can intimidate and get in the break. Maybe get somebody inside who would, uh, you know, turn traitor. That, all, that was oftentimes the case. But if this didn't happen, then they would just go right back the way they came. And they would just raid the village on the way out. For nearly 300 years, the castle had thwarted the best efforts of every medieval army that crossed its path. The age of gunpowder and cannon swung the balance of power from defense to offense. Feudalism in, in the Eastern Empire. We're going to go back to that funny word, pranoia, again. There has been significant debate about feudal practices in the Byzantine Empire. George Ostrogovsky romanticized the link between Western feudalism and similar practices in the Byzantine Empire known as pranoia. Mark Bartusis, a leading scholar on late Byzantine military history, probably the best, deconstructed this thesis. He showed that Western feudalism, in fact, was very different from Byzantine pranoia. In fact, there was very little in common between the two systems, even though on, on face value they looked very similar. Here are the key differences. Pronaires, these are the people who were like the vassals in Western Europe, they did not have any legal right to the land. In essence, they were renters with no rights. Pronaires also received their land directly from the emperor. It was purely a fiscal arrangement. This was because there wasn't any money around. So in order to keep some semblance of a professional army, they had to be able to feed them and be able to take care of their families. And anything that they had in excess, they would be able to sell and make money off of. And this oftentimes is the case. I was even asked if they use sub -infudation. And this is when Sort of like if you own a big home, if you rent out a room in your house, did they do that on their land if it was profitable? And I'm sure that they did, but they did do that. But the third point was that it was not widely practiced in the Byzantine Empire. The sources just do not confirm it. There's just so little documentary evidence that we have to assume that this was not a common practice. As in Western Europe, it was very common 